Hello, everybody, and welcome to Todd and Shane's Cloudy Podcast number 404, recorded live Wednesday, October 3rd, 2018. Good morning, Shane. Good morning, Todd. Um, I would just like to point out, we'll get it out of the way now. Everyone knows we're going to make really corny 404, not found jokes. So There are some very obvious jokes that will have to be beaten into the ground today. Yep, so I, I apologize I, now. Yep, chat room, go ahead as you think of your, your favorite 404 jokes and throw them in the chat room for, uh, for show title suggestions, and we'll do our best to, to wedge them in if we can find a place to do that. Other show notes, I think. Man, so we are only, what, seven days after we recorded the last podcast since yes. we recorded 403, and I believe that it has been out for, like, four of those seven days. Like, I think I got it done two days after. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, I'm kind of a big deal here. I'm, I'm really kicking butt. So, congratulations to me. Yeah, you know, kudos to you, kudos. I, I, I want to mock you for it, but I, good job. Find it. And the other thing, something that has been bothering Shane for months, call it six months at least, maybe more. Some of you noticed several months ago, some of our eagle-eyed viewers who are watching the YouTube version or the video version have noticed that over my right-hand shoulder, there's been a, a piece of paper with an X on it. The whole reason for that was me, uh, since I started working with the SysKit folks here a few months ago, I wanted to put a SysKit logo over my shoulder because I wanted, you know, Shane's got his stuff and I'm going to have some stuff and it's, you know... I want this this back wall to look like a NASCAR car as it goes by. And so I had that piece of paper up there just kind of to see how it sized over my shoulder and all that. And I just had a big white piece of paper with an X on it, never really making the SysKit logo for that. Last week, I did the webinar for the SysKit folks. It was great. We laughed. We cried. And I thought it would be good of me to do that. So I just, before I went on the air, I printed out an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with the SysKit logo. So now I got that. And now Shane is still not happy. Now the corner over here was flapping up a little, so I did uh, did some spot fixing on that. Still not enough for Mr. Young. Still uh, still unhappy. I mean, I, I have to give you, it looks a lot better since you did the tape job that I asked. Um, I'd also like to point out that the video is currently frozen when you're pointing at SysKit. So, like, what a sponsor moment. You're going to be pointing at them for the next 30 seconds to two minutes. So that, that is awesome. I think my machine is going to get a cleansing reboot after this uh after this podcast, probably should have done it beforehand. I, I think we both should have done that. I think in hindsight, yes. Yep. All right. So, what are our topics for this week? You've got the the first one on the list here. Ah, uh, so I want to give a shout out to one of our longtime listeners, one of our favorite people, and my certified flow genius, Fausto. He helped me um, with a flow that did some crazy shenanigans uh, using uh, OneNote. So basically, I have a financial really system. yeah go. Cool. I, I, I've often wanted to automate with OneNote, so I'm all ears. Yeah. Well, he, um, so what he figured out, so, or I guess I'm back up to what the customer wanted. So the customer is a financial uh, services company. You're not frozen anymore. Congratulations. Oh, sorry. I, should I get my finger out of my yeah. nose then? Is that, so, appreciate the subtle hint on that. That's yeah. why I was trying to cover you there. But so what, <laughs> uh, what they do is they, they do notes on different tickers, right? So if Microsoft releases something that is, in, uh, you know, relevant to their traders, they want to capture that information and they want to store it in OneNote. They're trying to move to like an Office 365 centric for everything. Can't so, love OneNote too much. Yeah, right. And so we've already we've already written them an app that all their trades and stuff from the uh, the trading desk or from the uh, client reps go into that to make their way to the trading desk. That's pretty cool. But so this one, he wants it so that you can kick off a flow. It will. Go into the uh, the notebook and find a section uh, coordinated with that ticker. So it'll set, look to see if MSFT is in the list anywhere. If it is, great. Then take the note, make a new page in the notebook, in that inside that section, and dump in the the, the data. Okay. If it's the section is not there, then what we're going to do is we're going to create the section, then create the page, and create the note. It pretty straightforward process it sounds like but it's a really complicated flow it turns out yeah they uh, released man a couple of years ago some apis for interacting with one note through office 365 not the standalone stuff and i looked at that briefly and holy crap just walking through the different levels of objects like i would love to have some kind of flow or something where when i'm reading a news article or something i want to talk about in the podcast there's something that i can do that will shoot it into the show notes for the next podcast. Well, thanks to Fausto, I can send you the exact code to do that. Well, there we go. So for me, then it was one line farther. So it would be, you know, go to the, the notebooks tab, 
then find the page for whatever the next podcast is and then find the section of that page because our page has different sections and then add it somewhere in there. I don't know if you can get that yeah. far down the rabbit hole. And one th- yeah, one of the things you have to figure Talk out. Talk to your man, Fausto. Yeah, I mean, he's probably listening. But we, uh, one of the uh, intre- or one of the tough parts, back to you know, calling out that it's all API driven, is you're exactly right. So we do everything in uh, JSON, right? So you yeah. have to go and get it, and then you get these terrible gu- GUIDs because you know they're like, hey, the SharePoint guys used all the GUIDs. We want to try and do the same thing. Yeah, so, it's like there's a prize for the person who uses the last GUID at the end. Like whoever does it, they get a big prize. So anyway, kudos to him. I want to give him a shout out because he went above and beyond anything a friend should do to be like, here you go. Here's here's a Word document, Shane, that is dummy proof. Even you can follow along how this works. Well, thank you, Fausto, making something uh, Shane proof. I've been struggling with that for, you know, 12 years, 13 years. I can understand the amount of effort that that takes. So I appreciate that. All right. Um, I guess I have number two also. So that's a fun one. So to talk about that. Um, and then I, I, I've got a thing about that too. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you're going to have all the smarts about this. But So I don't know where I was. You know, I was probably reading the old tweeter. <clears throat> and somebody posted a link to this TED Talk. And it is the difference between the UK, Great Britain, and England. And I'm not going to lie to anyone. I am a dumb American who is really bad at geography. And, and, even- and hates foreign everything. Like hates anything outside of the bounds of the U.S. <sighs> Oh, that's probably fair. Um, but so uh, I watched this about three or four times. I still couldn't answer the questions if you asked me, you know, here live, hint, hint. Um, but what I, but it was really neat because it did kind of talk about how the, the, the nuances between the UK, the Great Britain and England, you know, and basically how you know, the, the different islands and things that the different little countries, they still have uh, some form of control over and it's a complicated question. I, it was amazing how many nooks and crannies there were to the answer to that question. Yep. I probably uh, erroneously think that I could explain it and understand it. But many years ago, I like quiz myself on it. So there's a, a guy that writes for Ars Technica, a guy named Peter Bright. I don't okay. know if you've met Peter. Okay. So he and I are friends and he is from the UK and England and the British Isles. And he and I were chatting about it one time and like, I sat down and I explained to him how I thought it broke down and then he corrected me a little bit and then like a couple of weeks later, I ran it past him again to see if I retained it. And so at one point in the past, a legitimate Brit who is fairly well educated gave me the thumbs up that I had an idea what it was. Well, kudos to you. I I do no. not. You know, And to me, that's almost as complicated. Um, I'm going to kind of steal my own thunder here. But so uh, the kids we were arguing about, you know, is a thumb a finger? <laughs> turns out that is not a straightforward question either. No. Um, right. And I think what it really boils down to is finger is a made up word. So, you know, whatever definition of the word finger you want to use, you can include thumb or not include thumb. So I don't want to you know steal anyone else's uh, excitement there, but we, we went and did some research on it and it's like, yep. yes, the answer is yes or no. It- it's whatever you want it to be. It's funny, those things, certainly, you know, I grew up in kind of a rural area long before the internet and all that. You you get this idea that the way you learn things is just the way that it is. So if you learned that the thumb was not a finger, nobody on earth is going to convince you otherwise because everybody feels the same way. One of my kids was doing a a thing at school on the continents and the oceans. And so, you know, memorizing the seven continents and and she had it all down. I'm like, now I'm going to blow your mind. Not everybody in the world thinks there's seven continents. She's like, what? (laughs) I'm like, oh, yeah. You start talking to some of those foreigners, they get this idea like five continents. And she's like, no way. I'm like, yeah, I was probably 30 when I learned that. So you're you're 20 years ahead of me. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. If you make up words, you can make them be whatever you want, I guess. Yep. So so I think the way that it works, Uh oh. England is a country. And England is a country on an island. It is part of a federation of, that is the united kingdom that includes scotland and wales and northern ireland and then there are british isles which includes that island and the island of ireland which also contains another sovereign country ireland or the republic of ireland um and great britain i believe is just the island on the east i believe 
How'd I do? <laughs> <laughs> I told you not to ask me. I've watched it three times and without like a bullet points here, I, I got nothing for you. Oh, that's hysterical. Because you didn't yeah, bring that... up the other ones, right? Because there's still portions of the United Kingdom, I believe, or is it Great Britain? One of those two has like United some Kingdom. islands that are like all over the world. Yeah, because they used to, the sun never set on the, exactly. the British Empire. Yeah, uh, that's funny stuff. Uh, okay, so so we have a couple celebrities in the chat room. Uh, both of them are named John, which is going to be very confusing. Uh, but John Levesque is in the chat room, and, and John Liu both. And we've got another flow topic. Uh, so let's hit that before either of those two get smart and leave the chat room. Which, where, what number is flow? C. Oh, that's what I was. Oh, okay. The, they, okay. they were they were the flow topic. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's funny. So we were all excited. We talked about flow first. And I swear to God, seven seconds after we stopped talking about flow, John shows up. And by John, I mean both of them. Yeah. I mean, I think that this really shows you the power we have, right? We mentioned flow. You know, John Levesque comes in from the Microsoft side. Like, hey, what are I'm here. I'm here. We're just talking about flow. What's going on? Yeah. And then John Lowe shows up like, all right, you guys need an adult in the room. You need somebody who actually understands how to use flow. So and, it, and John Liu is in Australia, so it might be Saturday afternoon there. Like, I don't even know when it is in Australia right now. Yeah, I'm in some flow groups chats with John, and I, I, I just assume that John Liu never sleeps. I mean, it'll be like 5 o'clock in the morning there, and he'll be like, oh, yeah, Shane, let me help you with this thing real quick. And he'll like crank out some code, and I'm like, John, go go to bed. I, I, I appreciate it. I love you. Kisses. Mwah, but go to bed. <laughs> Yeah, and I just want to go try, trying to make myself look cool, you know, riding their coattails. I knew John Liu before John Liu was cool. Before Flo, I've known John for like five or six years. He's been in the chat room. I've been to Australia and hung out with him. He's been to the U.S. We've hung out, at like MVP Summit, stuff like that. Well, so John and I go way back, far cooler than you. All right, what are we supposed to be talking about? What's next? Ignite. And so we did a bad job. You have some Ignite stuff. I have not done a good job categorizing all of the amazing things that were announced at Ignite last week. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. so I think you all know, right? For Petri.com, I write a monthly article, you know, what's uh, everything you need to know about SharePoint for, or for the month and everything you need to know about Office uh, 365 for the month. Yep. And so I tried to write those, like literally, you know, as Ignite was closing down. And I just had to start the articles out with, look, there's no chance this is everything because so much happened you know, I almost, I don't understand. I mean, I understand Microsoft, you know, tries to use it as their platform to get out a bunch of messages. Yeah. But it was too many, right? Too much, too awesome, cool stuff was announced all at once that you just couldn't consume it all, or at least I can't. And I don't know. I don't know even where to begin. Where, like, you know, we talk about this a lot, right? How do you keep up in Office 365 with the pace of change? But how do you keep up with Ignite when... The pace of change is like quadrupled for a week. I, yeah, I I agree with that uh, completely. And I think Microsoft, and they're not the only ones that do this, but we're picking on Microsoft now, so we'll pick on Microsoft. The other thing is they compound that by announcing things that you can't actually get today. Yes. So there are enough things that you can actually do today that we would be satisfied, but they're trying to hit this cadence of, you know, ignites at the end of September. So everybody announced everything and then stuff gets behind. So you get all this, you know, this avalanche of announcements. Some of it you can do today. Some of it you can't do until December or whatever. And it just, it's, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. You know, like really I, to your point, right. I kind of liked the idea like when ignite, like especially like keynotes and stuff were, more the more forward facing ones, right? So it wasn't any announcements of things they'd previously done, you know, because they pre announced it. It was like, here's our vision for uh, nano computing or something, right? Things that are kind of legitimately out there. So then that yeah. way, you know, you can kind of focus in the keynote, all right, this is kind of my vision of where we're headed instead of these keynotes where it's like, here's 17 features, six of them work today, 12 of them will work next week, and three of them will work in two years. Yeah, and then there's four or five that will never come because for whatever reason they just didn't work out. Yeah, you know, like the Hol like was there? I mean, uh, once again, I'm behind. But was there any of the Hololens stuff that we saw at SharePoint conference? I don't think they tried to do, you know, the augmented reality SharePoint document library on stage again anyway. But I didn't see anything. I also didn't last year. The the keynote at Ignite was all about the quantum computing. I didn't hear much about that this year. But again, I wasn't really looking. So who knows? 
so yeah, we really, so I, I struggled, you know, things I did pull out of it, um, what was one of the good ones? So one of the things I did pull out was the whole, they announced Office 2019, which actually did a good job of confusing me. So I had to like stop was, and think about it. Yes, I was thoroughly confused as well. Right. And so one of the things I think that a lot of us, it's easy to forget, right? Your version of Office today, you know, is either, is most likely either you have Office 2016, the standalone clients, right? Uh -huh. That whole little package. Yep. Or you have Office 365, which we think of as SharePoint, Power Apps, Flow, and all that stuff. But Office 365 is also a client set of Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Yep. And so, and that's the one that's called Click to Run, correct? Yes. Right? So you have these two different versions of the Office clients, which I always thought were the same, you know, just different ways of getting them. But it turns out that if you have the Office 365 Click to Run clients, you have different features than people who have the Office 2016 standalone clients. And yep. my, my mind and my brain just got really, really sad when I tried to understand it. Yeah, mine too. And that, the first time I found that was there were ways to add things and they would be like, well, if you're running the click to run version of Word or Excel, it's here. And yeah, like, I don't even know what that means. And I think, so now I've got, you know, like, like any self-respecting computer nerd, I've got about seven or eight PCs that I use on a daily basis. And I try to keep some, I try to keep them separate. Some are running the standalones, uh, some are running the click to run. So I just have both platforms to look at when looking at things like autosave and, and things like that. Yeah. Well, I it is confusing. Yeah. And so I, my primary driver here, I'm running Office 365, um, or sorry, I'm running Office 2016 standalone. So I guess... I have the rights to the click to run, so I guess I need to switch to that so I get the cooler, newer features. There you go. That's an example of being overwhelmed from Ignite content and not getting more than two seconds to think through what, what they even said. Yeah. So we should probably get that all put together and do maybe do that next week or something. But I think really the important thing to talk about is letter E. Oh, all right. So those of you, a little background, right? Those of you that have ever been to one or Todd and I sessions, which we've had the privilege of doing all over the world for millions and millions of people, is we always try to suck up to the audience. And to suck mm -hmm. up to the audience, we play a fascinating game called Heads or Tails. We, we've literally played Heads or Tails with eh, about 3,000 people one time. Yes, thousands of people at one time, yes. And it's a very simple, you know, put your hand on your head. If you think we're going to flip a head, put a hand on your tail. If you think we're going to flip a tail... Then we do an inappropriate HR joke, um, and then I flip well head about 70% of the time. Yep. And Todd can't catch us at the last time. <laughs> I lose it in the lights. It's very bright. There. <laughs> it was hilarious. Anyway, so Todd was in a, a charity event this last weekend, right? Because he's very hoity-toity on the weekends. He puts on his, uh, you know, his three-piece tuxedo with the, the top hat and the cane, and he goes to monocle, charity events. Yep. Oh, yes, the monocle, right? You and Bruce Wayne are at the same events, I assume. <laughs> Maybe I am Bruce Wayne. Have you ever seen? Uh, and so, Todd, what happened at this charity event? Not that <laughs> children got money or anything like that. No one cares about the charity portion. What did no, you, let's, what let's not focus on the uh, minutia. So they, one of the things that they did was you could they, – they wanted to play this game. They had a bunch of stuff. And they called it forks or spoons. So you could, for $20, you could buy a fork and a spoon, and then they would play heads or tails. And the spoon was heads, the fork was tails. Same thing. So now we've got a room of like 300 people. I don't know how many were playing, half, something like that. And so Jill knows the backstory of you and I playing heads or tails, and she's heard many hysterical anecdotes about the, the shenanigans that we do. And so we just buy one as the couple, and she gives it to me. She's like, this is your thing. Now, you and I played heads or tails forever. And so, like, I get why she thought I was the expert, but I was like, man, I'm going to fail and this is going to suck because she thinks I'm the expert. I'm going to do this and I'm going to, like, drop the spoon. I'm going to hold them both up. I'm just going to, I'm going to embarrass myself. But I'm like, all right, I get it. I'm, I'm the heads or tails guy. So, the MC, who is a friend of mine, which is kind of funny, explaining the rules to everybody and he had a practice run. So, he's like, oh, here's the deal. We're going to do practice run. This one doesn't count. You know, hold up your spoon if you think it's going to be a head. Hold up your fork if you think it's going to be a tail. And he throws it, and it's a heads. And I'm like, I know how this is going to go. I know I know the guy flipping the coin because I have him as a partner. It's going to be heads. So, and then you and I have talked. I want to get on a rabbit hole here. But there's some way, there's legitimately ways to predict how heads or tails are going to go. We, we've talked about all that. And so I'm like, okay, we got it. And it went, I don't know, seven or eight rounds. 
But I kept not like I was like, all right, this guy's going to predominantly throw heads. So I would do a couple heads. I'm like, all right, probably time for a tails. So I'd stick the fork up. It would be tails. And one thing that they didn't do that you and I always do is what happens when you get down to two people. And so it got down to two people, me and one other guy. And I got this guy pegged, uh, the, the flipper. I got him pegged as a heads guy. And so I'm like, okay, I'm doing heads. So I hold up my spoon and the other guy's like, no, nah, I want heads. So, you know, and they'd never talked about how that works. And I'm like, well, you know, you can switch to tails because if we both have heads, this doesn't work. And he's like, no, nah, I'm not going to switch. And the MC, is, he's never done this before. He's like, no, nah, I think you can both be the same. I'm like, well, then how do you decide who wins? He's like, well, if you both have it right, you stay standing. And if you both don't, then I guess we flip again. And I'm like, rookie, rookie, this guy. But I'm like, all right, well, I'm sticking with heads. Flips the coin, it's heads, we're both still in. And I'm like, do you see how this isn't going to work now? So my buddy's like, well, all right, why don't you guys come up front? And I'm, I'm, I'm going up to the front of the stage because we're in this big banquet room. I only have my spoon. Like I left my fork on the table. I am all in on heads. I feel so strongly about heads. So we walk up there, the guy and I shake our hand, you know, shake each other's hands, which other good luck. The guy flips the coin. I'm proudly holding my spoon up and it's heads. So the very first time I ever play heads or tails as a participant, not as a, you know, a, a dealer or whatever, I win. So I win, you know, the adoration of everybody in the room, their, their love and respect for me was palpable. And since I knew the MC, as soon as he called heads, I run over, I give him a big hug and I give him a big kiss on the cheek and um, it was a good time. So I won, yeah, a couple hundred dollars worth of gift certificates for restaurants in town and things like that. And But the children won, right? That was the key. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I forget that. I, but I did a victory lap around the room and I was giving people high fives <laughs> holding my spoon up. <laughs> yeah. And, and you said, you know, right. One of the things that people don't appreciate is that we run into this occasion people using our game, right? At this point, Todd and I have patented heads or tails. Yes. Yes. And they just, they don't ever do it well, right? They miss the no. obvious jokes. They don't, yeah. poke fun, they don't pick a favorite in the crowd. No. So, yeah, and they didn't like have somebody look at the coin to ver. I mean, there were so many things they could have done, and I, I didn't give them that feedback. I have done. I have been that guy, and I have talked about this. I we saw a couple of dueling piano folks, my wife and I, and they did the heads or tails thing, and I went up afterwards and critiqued their performance. <laughs> I think it's valuable feedback. We should have a consulting services heads or tails consulting services dot com. I'm like, you guys missed some very obvious jokes. You're going to want to write this down. Uh, here's. Uh, Here's what you should have done. Um, and so I, I did take a picture. I, I, so I texted Shane immediately and uh, told him about my good fortune. And I did take a picture of the lucky spoon. And of uh, so I'm putting that in the chat room now. So, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a good time. Right, well, uh -huh. And I'm guessing no one really cares, right? Because if you watch the chat room, speaking of that, right, they're writing PowerShell. John, L John Liu went and wrote a flow. Yep. I think, oh, yeah. Uh, I think we might have bored them with this. Well, and we've done story. that. So you and I have done that. We've done a PowerShell session. And before we did that, we did heads or tails and we use PowerShell, you know, heads, comma, tails, get random, all that. Yep. We've, uh, we've done that before. Yeah. It's, uh, oh, Jeff but. Hicks has now written a function to do it a hundred times and then group it so he can tally it. The, <laughs> the, the nerd level that we have invoked over here, right? They don't care about the story, but we, we planted to see. Now they're like, Yeah. <laughs> Yep. And Jeff, that your suggestion is going to come back in a later, uh, later thing. So let's, uh, so anyway, that was great fun and it was very, very fun to be on the other end of it. And, and I won and I've got the lucky spoon to prove it. So, yeah. All right. So next up on our list of topics, um, oh, Jeff did it a thousand times and his machine threw more heads than tails. Good job machine. Okay. Stop. Focus Shane. Focus. Uh, so small business security was another topic, right? I don't have a good segue out of, you know, Todd uh, and Bruce Wayne to uh, small business security here. But, you know, uh, one of the contracts we had to sign this week uh, for Power Apps 911, the customer was like super vigilant on security, right? They had a, a, a CISO, you know, they had 100 pages of legalese of like, you know, all the security requirements we needed to be to be a contractor and the processes and all the things they could do. And that was a pain. But we got through all of it. But as part of it, you know, um, Nicola and I, right, as you guys all know, Nicola is actually the CEO of Power Apps 911 because mm -hmm. she's the smart one, the good looking one. and like, The adult supervision. And yep. the adult supervision. But uh, we had a chat about small business security. And it's a tough conversation, right? We have, you know, yeah. three full-time employees. We've got three or four contractors at this point. 
you know, but we run it here out of my basement, right? As you can tell, I'm in my basement. Woo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can confirm that I've been in that room. And it's, it's very, um, it's a tough topic, right? I mean, you know, it's easy to say things like, okay, yep, we got firewalls, you know, we, we install PC updates, but you know, physical security, what's our policy on that? Well, I don't know. It's my house. My kids, you know, my neighbor's kids are running around here. I mean, how do you quantify that? Um, you know, password policies. So, you know, should we force password changes? It's a pain in my butt. I don't want to change my password. You know, should nope. we have multi-factor passwords? There's all of these things. And so her and I had a pretty tough conversation about kind of all the different things. And I tried to go look up like the NIST or, or NIST, okay. yeah, NIST, right? They have a, um, you know, some small business security guidelines, but I'm like, well, oh, this doesn't apply. This doesn't apply. And a big part of it is, is, you know, for me, you know, my business, my personal life, they're one and the same, right? I'm literally just, I work, you know, I'm always working. I'm always, I, I don't know. So it's a tough conversation. And it sounds like you kind of had some different thoughts on maybe how I'm doing it all wrong. So I can't wait to hear this. Well, I think there's no one right answer. And so that was kind of thing. And I have a much smaller business than you, but I think you're, um, Throughout the entire time I've known you, your business has been your life. So there's very – like for, for the longest time, and I think to this day, I don't think I've ever had a personal email address for you. It's always been your business email address. <laughs> Whereas I mostly keep those apart. And I keep those apart for a couple of reasons in case, for instance, you uh, come to work someday and get laid off and don't know that your work address isn't going to work anymore. That's a bad reason to use your work address. Not that that's happened to anybody on this podcast uh, a couple of times. So I have always got that separated and I've always been much different. I don't want to say better, better about separating, but not necessarily better practice. So I think it comes down to a lot of those things as to, you know, where, you know, what your level of commitment is. And, and so I, I have a little less commitment than you do. Yeah. So I don't do as much of that. Yeah. I mean, it's weird, right? It's so like we need to do like do security training, right? So, I mean, I'm going to make a PowerPoint and I'm going to walk, you know, uh, Nicola and Jeff, right? The two full-time employees through it and be like, don't click on spam. You know, don't, right. Don't click on these links. Don't click on pop-ups. Don't give anyone your password. Don't write your, pa right. And, it, and, it, and I have a hard time with that type of stuff. Cause I'm like, you wouldn't be here if you didn't know these things, right? I don't hire yeah. Front line. I don't hire non-technical people. I, I only hire people who know as much about that type of stuff as they need to or not. I, yeah. But it's good to have a written policy that says, yes, everyone's had this security training. Oh, I, I really struggled with the conversation. Yeah, and I, I think that's all true, but I also think that stuff changes. So you could know all there is to know or have a reasonable level of security now, but a year from now not keep up on some crazy security thing. You know, like I, I've seen videos of how people, how hackers have exploited and gotten past multi-factor authentication. I don't think most people know that that's a possibility, but it is. I've seen it happen. So that all that all changes yeah, I, over time. But I always love to see you step outside your boundaries and do things you don't like to do and grow as a person. Boo. So speaking of security. Yes. Should we talk about our friends at App River? Ah, because they provide a layer, extra layer of security on top of Office 365 for like they spam filtering and do. all those fun things, virus uh, protections. Yeah, I think they're a great example of what uh, what you're looking for, right? Because that, that was a big part of our security response was we don't have any on-premises servers anymore. We only have in the cloud and it's all Office 365. Right. So anything I can do to make that platform better and more secure which you know, Microsoft does a really great job to begin with, but taking it that next level by partnering with someone like App River as my reseller of Office 365, I think yeah. it's just, it's, it's one more checkbox, right? It's, what we, you, you've summed it up well, so I'm gonna screw it up for now, but right, security is about just making yourself not the easiest target, right? You're just making trying to, yourself a harder target, yep. Yeah, right, we're just trying to move ourselves up the stack so they're like, oh, that guy has no passwords, let's hack him before we hack this guy with multi-factor. So, yeah. and I think App River just helps you move up that stack a little bit. Yeah. So there, are, when when you're talking about security, there are kind of two types of attacks. Some of them are attacks of opportunity, and that's the the making yourself a hard target. And I would guess that's the bulk of them. Yes, if somebody is bound and determined to hack Shane Young, that is not a an attack of opportunity. That is a, a targeted attack, and they will likely find a way, depending on all of that. 
but that's not the bulk of them. And, and so it's like that whole thing, you know, when anybody says, well, I would use, uh, I would change my password, but then somebody was just going to figure it out, blah, blah, blah. My first question to them is, do you lock your doors? Because you've all seen somebody kick a damn door down. Like, you know, it can be overridden. So why do you even bother locking your door? I mean, I've kicked multiple doors down and it's way easier than I thought it would ever be. So why do I even lock my door? Why? Because it's the crime of opportunity. Because if somebody's just going by wiggling doorknobs, my door is going to be locked and they're not going to want to kick the door frame down. They're going to keep moving. So doing a lot of these things just makes you a harder target, makes you move on, makes the bad guys move on to somebody else. So valid stuff. I get it. It's a, uh, it's a great one. You know, and that reminds me of one of the things I don't have in the show notes, but when I was trying to read, you know, all of the office 360 or all the ignite announcements at once, uh, one of the things that they've introduced is some new uh, macro virus protections using some AI stuff. Um, so they're apparently going to wrap, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to wrap all of the, the macros and the, the scripts that you can run inside of the office clients inside of a new shell to hopefully stop, you know, all these different exploits that people are doing with macros and things. Yeah. Once again, type of thing that I don't think about. I don't want to think about if I'm just on the office 365 click to run client one day, I'll just show up and I'll be better protected. And I didn't do anything. And that's a win in my book. Yep. Uh, so if you want to hear more about app river, and again, this is for office 365 resellers. So consultants like you and I that also do the office 365 thing, you can go to toddclint.com slash app river. That will bounce you over to their page and let you know all the great things that app river has to offer you. And it really does add just another level of protection and auditing and awareness to the great things that Microsoft's already doing. And, uh, I highly recommend it. I have to circle back in the chat room. John Levesque is calling me out. He doesn't think that I'm tough enough to kick down a door. He wants video proof. Uh, I'm not going to do it right now because I don't have any doors I don't like. But the first time that I did it, it was at a you know two or three houses ago, and I'd locked myself out. We've all watched movies of people kicking doors down. And I'm like, I wonder how easy that is. And I was like, just kind of going for a test run. I kind of like put my foot against the door and just kind of pressed a little bit because I didn't want to like break a hip or anything. G gave it a little, gave a little nudge and like the door jam just shattered and the door flew open. I'm like, well, that was way <laughs> easier than it should have been. Oh, so I've done it. Yeah. It's, and, and like I was telling John in the chat room, watching me kick a door down is just a damn masculine sight to behold. I mean, it is just all that it is, man, right there. Just me overpowering, um, all of that. Uh huh. Yeah. You show up with your, uh, your, your baby blue V neck striped shirt. You're currently wearing, <laughs> you, you, know, you put down your latte, you hand somebody your, your man purse, and then you go, Hey, yeah. Show me the door, which needs <laughs> kicking open. Yeah. And I agree. It's, uh, I don't want to break a hip. I think that has got to be the show title because let's just face it that uh, we've reached the age. We have to start thinking about things like not breaking a hip. We are not young men anymore. All right. What do you got uh, for H? So H is a fun one. Man, this is H is one of those things where I just think back and say, you know, being a consultant is so much fun. And things like H is one of those things. So, uh, I think she's in the chat room, Lynn Dye, a long time friend of the show. She's been watching this podcast almost as long as Lori has, almost as long as I have. Met her in person a bunch of times. Lynn is salt of the earth. She does some, she's more of like end user things, not so much IT pro. Love Lynn to death. So she gets a hold of me. I think she sends me an email Sunday night or Monday morning early. And she has a client, a customer, and they were, I think I'm telling the story right. And if not, it's artistic flair. It doesn't matter. But they had a customer who was syncing a very large document library in Office 365. And that customer went in on the file system and deleted everything not understanding the syncing and all of that. And so for several days, the OneDrive sync client was syncing deleted files. I don't want to skip to the end, but when they finally caught it, there were 94,000 files that had been deleted over this three-day period. Nice. Yeah, so they, they killed the client. They realized. So Lynn came to me and she's like, hey, I, I know that there's recycle bins and all this kind of stuff. What is the easiest way, say, to restore 94,000 files without, you know, clicking a screen and bringing over all that? Uh, and so that was one of those things which just, I mean, the story is great. I'll be telling the story for years. But the actual figuring out of how to do it is uh, – <laughs> Is a, is a lot of fun. So my first thought was the files restore feature that OneDrive has, but this wasn't in OneDrive. This was in a SharePoint document library, and I didn't see a way to do it in there. So then my next weapon of choice 
is PowerShell because PowerShell's greatest strength is just looping through things and doing the same thing over and over again. And so what I ended up doing was writing a line of PowerShell, actually two lines of PowerShell, that goes out using the PNP PowerShell, uses the get PNP recycle bin items, and then filters for the exact things that we want. Because this is a big tenant. There's a lot of people in there. So there's a lot of things that were in the recycle bin that were legitimately things that didn't need to be uh, restored. So I was able to say, okay, I want only the items that were deleted by this person that were in this path and in this time frame. So I got that into a collection. And then I took that collection and I just piped it right into restore PNP uh, recycle bin item and just started churning through. Problem solved. Except the problem wasn't completely solved. There were a couple of hiccups, being that it just doesn't happen very fast. And we were talking about 94,000 files. So right now, as I'm watching, you can't really see, but I am running that on four different machines right now. It's been running for a couple of days. We're a little over halfway done. And it's running on multiple machines because the bottleneck is an Office 365 or the servers on the back end. It's the client side. It's the PNP. It's walking through this list of tens of thousands of items. So I have four PowerShell windows open on four different machines. And Jeff Hicks in the chat room was talking about for his heads and tails, he was doing, you know, one dot dot a thousand, you know, the range thing in PowerShell. So that's what I ended up doing. I ended up going out, getting this collection full of items that were deleted from this place by this person over this time frame, you know, 90 some thousand items. And then on each of the four machines saying, okay, you get one through 10,000 restore all the items. You get 10,001 through 20,000. You restore all those items. Uh, and so that was able to use that PowerShell range feature to break that down so they weren't trampling over top of each other because the the time penalty for trying to restore an item that's already been restored is pretty great. I mean, it takes three or four seconds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but now multiply it by 90,000. So if you get two of these instances that are trying to restore the same set of files at the same time, you've wasted whatever. And it, uh, so it's turning through. It's not fast. It took several days to delete all these files. It's going to take a couple of days to bring them all back. <laughs> but they caught it quick enough so the recycle bin didn't get uh, emptied. So I will maybe uh, blog this at some point just so people can see how to use it. Because there were some mechanics things. Restore recycle bin item didn't didn't take the pipeline input the way I wanted. It didn't, honestly didn't give me the input output back that I wanted. So I had to you know put it in a for each loop and walk through some stuff. But it was uh, it was a lot of fun. And it's it's running right now, and I'm just kind of watching all these files uh, show up. Sitting there in your ne ne your knock, right? Your network operations center, just watching the screen and the updates. Like, yeah, I made that happen. Yep. And Jeff Hicks is in the chat room, and I would be remiss if I didn't uh, I didn't run this particular piece of PowerShell past him. But he has always been very supportive of you and I's stupid PowerShell blunders. And so had I not been able to knock this out in a couple of minutes like I did, I would have called crawling to Jeff and he would have mocked me and then helped me. And uh, so I want to want to give him a shout out. I always like when Jeff mocks you. He's, he's become quite good at it. <laughs> yeah, but no, you know, this reminds me of a story that kind of ties up that and our previous section. Um, so one of the people I work with, um, our dear friend from Boston that we had lunch with. I remember him. Um, so... They, uh, they use a third-party help desk software called Freshdesk, mm -hmm. um, which we were pretty happy with. But turns out that uh, some people from a foreign country decided to hack his instance of Freshdesk for no reason other than they created 54,000 tickets. They, uh. they just attacked it. They, you know, they broke through, and they just created 54,000 fake tickets to you know, mess up our system. Um, so, you know, back to your whole, you know, ha or, uh, you know, attacking or not, uh, not maliciously going after this company, but just because they found an instance and like, let me see if my script will really mess them up. And now, uh, he's fighting with the company to get them to delete all the, the bogus tickets. They're like, eh, it's not our problem. I'm like, well, your stuff got hacked. It kind of is. So it's a, it's a very awkward exchange that's going on, uh, right now. Yeah. And it's, uh. Yeah, it's, it's very tough. And with stuff in the cloud, you, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, speaking of Jeff Hicks, I have a couple, couple of PowerShell things as we're winding down. Yep. Jeff, I promised I would uh, give him some love on this one, the only kind of love that Jeff will let me give him. He recently published a PS calendar module that lets you display calendars and stuff in PowerShell. And you can go to uh, his blog, uh, jdhitsolutions.com. He has also been kind enough to put it out in the PowerShell gallery. So if you don't want to read all the words and all that kind of stuff, 
you can just go out to your favorite PowerShell prompt in admin mode and type install module PS calendar and you can get text calendars of PowerShell. He put a, a Windows Foundation or Windows uh, platform foundation thing so you can get the, the nice nice UI things out there. He's just always he's got like a million ideas in his head and he PowerShells the crap out of them and it's always inspiring to see what he can do. That's a pretty impressive looking. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't tried it out yet, but looking through the screenshots of kind of what he put in there, it <laughs> looks pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. So shout out to uh, to him. Another uh, Excel module that I've not used but I, I want to play with is an Excel module that lets you create Excel spreadsheets without having Excel installed on your machine. So this is one of these things that's been a, a bugaboo for me in the past is I've got some process running on a machine that doesn't have the Excel client installed on it. And there's no good way to use PowerShell to generate Excel data without Excel installed. But somebody years ago, this is on the Hey Scripting Guy uh, blog, wrote a, a module that can generate Excel files without Excel installed. Yeah, and so. that's one of those ones, right? I, I looked at it for like five minutes once, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to make CSVs. You open those in Excel just the same way. Shut up. Yep. Take and that's CSV. what I always do is make CSVs. But this is, I need to look at this. And so I guess one thing we haven't mentioned, all these links that we've been talking about, you can go to toddclint.com slash podcast 404, and we'll have all the links that you can grab this for, for those of you that are on the audio version. And we promise you will not get a not found link. But if you do, that'd yep. be hilarious. So we probably have time maybe for one more topic. This kind of went long because yeah, we have a do, lot of promotion. We'll just do O real quick. All right. Um, so finally I got back to making um, Power Apps videos. I've been way behind on making content because I literally work seven days a week on mm. customer projects. Mm -hmm. uh, but So I stopped and made a video on using uh, the Power Apps functions, add columns, show columns, rename columns, drop columns, sort by columns. Uh, just a bunch of those type of ones. And so this video was more like a lot of my videos are kind of like, you know, build a timesheet or build an expense report. This one was just function specific. And the reason for that, though, is it turns out that as you start to work with more complex apps, you want to have multiple data sources. You want to start doing, you know, because I use Azure SQL for most of my data sources and I have normalized tables. Right. So I have a client's table, a project's table and a customer's table. And, you know, when I create a record, I got to kind of tie sources up. So I ended up using a lot of foreign keys. And so you need to use uh, show columns in order to you know, reference the foreign keys and drop downs and things like that. It's, it's all explained there in the video, but just as you guys start to think about Power Apps, you start thinking, how do I go to that next level? How do I start having multiple data sources, foreign keys? How do I start doing um, calculations of like yeah. large data sets? Uh, those functions are a big part of that. Um, so I just want to kind of put that out there. I think it's pretty, it's pretty short video. It's pretty handy though. And it really kind of gets me leads away to my next one's going to be, is we're going to start talking about how to do uh, joins, right? So, a, you know, if you've ever been a SQL DBA or had those skills, you know that doing joins is kind of, it's a big part of bringing normalized data back together. And more complicated than I feel like it ever should be. Like I can never just spit one out. Oh gosh, no, I couldn't write one in five minutes if my life depended on it. I need to be like, oh, I gotta stop. I gotta get an abacus out, you know, and kind of do all this. But anyway, so doing joins in Power Apps is also, it's probably easier, honestly, than doing them in SQL, but it's still pretty complicated. So I'm trying to kind of pave my way to getting into showing people that. Baby steps, baby so. steps. Good to know. All right, so let's move to the community corner a little bit, continuing with our flow um, stuff for today. One of the things, and I think I just pulled this one out myself, but one of the people I saw uh, posting in Twitter with some stuff was April Dunham. She blogs at SharePointSiren.com. Uh, so I was going to take that uh, URL, but she already had it because I think I would make a, a great SharePoint Siren. But she does a lot of things with flow. She blogs a lot about that. And I think the thing that she blogged about that I liked was she was looking for speakers for the Oklahoma Power Apps and Flow user group. Oh. And so you know, uh, you listeners know that Shane and I are very supportive of all of these things. We like user groups and people uh, speaking at user groups and kind of getting their feet wet. So if you do Power Apps or Flow and want to speak at a user group, and I don't know if they can do it remotely, go fill the form out or go to SharePointSiren.com and look. But that is a great way to do that. And this is that time where we talk about the curse of knowledge and all of that. But I don't have anything to offer. Yes, you do. If you're doing anything with Flow or Power Apps, somebody doesn't know how to do it. And they would love to watch you teach them how to do it. So don't talk yourself into thinking you don't have anything to offer. True story. That's a, that's a great one. April's a great person. So uh, help her out. There you go. There you go. 
All right, so uh, we get into Shameless Promotion. We got a lot of these folks. It is apparently conference season for Todd and I. Yes, yes. Shane and I are busy, busy people. So Power Summit, uh, that's going to be a collection of 7,000 Power Apps, Flow, uh, Power BI, Dynamics people coming together for one big old user conference. That'll be pretty cool. October 15th through 18th in Phoenix. I'm doing about 17 things there because I had to be there all week. So I'm like, you just keep signing me up for things. I will not say no. So I, I'm emceeing a thing. I think I'm catering lunch one day. You know, <laughs> I, I, I am there. So, and if you sign up before tomorrow, you can still save a hundred dollars. So get out there and do that. So am I hearing this right that I'm flying solo in two weeks on, uh, on the 17th? Hmm. That's pro. well, it'll depend on what probably. the internet's like. You look into it. Yep. Yep. So then, um, speaking of Power Apps and Flow user groups, the Cincinnati chapter is about to spin up. And so that will be October 24th here in Cincinnati, about a mile that way, maybe two miles that way. Um, for those of you who can't see, I'm pointing in that direction. Does that help? No, it doesn't. <laughs> I, I know exactly where you're going. The, the curve's out there. Yep. I... Exactly. But uh, that'll be October 24th. And so I'm going to do uh, a brief little session. And then Todd Beginski is going to join us and do a brief little session. Uh, so kind of get a lot of power apps and flowy stuff. And then that's all being put on by our dear friend Vivek, who I know from the power apps and flow community. So pretty excited to see that come together. Oh, is it me already? I got, I, I sort of nodded off. Yeah, Todd fell asleep, folks. If you weren't watching a video, you did not see Todd close his eyes while I was talking. I just, uh, so then that Friday, I'm going to be in Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha, one of uh, Peyton Manning's favorite places. I'll be teaching a, an, an in-person workshop on SharePoint on-prem and Office 365 administration. The, the, uh, Dave Peterson, my friend in Omaha, is putting that together, giving me a platform to do that. It is only $50. You can sign up for that. Hang out with me all day in beautiful, sunny Omaha, Nebraska. If you've heard the Bob Seger song, turn the page, uh, you know, uh, uh, Interstate 80 and all that, this is you can go there. It's almost like going to Winslow, Arizona because of the Eagles song. But come hang out with me on Friday, October 26th in Omaha, Nebraska. Would love to talk about uh, Office 365 and SharePoint on-prem uh, administration and do all those fun things. I don't know why, but as you started to tell that story, it reminded me of the whole Star Trek driving through Iowa and the big old Grand Canyon being in the middle of it. I don't know why, but as you're you know, sp sp talking about Bob Seger, I had visions of you riding off a cliff in Iowa. So it was funny when it, so I was the, the, the reboot of the Star Trek movie. I was talking to somebody about that. I'm like, man, that did not take place in Iowa. That is so ridiculous. When Kurt comes up and there's a big chasm, like I know where Riverside, Iowa is. There's no big chasm there. And I'm going off and the person looks at me and I, I, I stop with my pontificating and they just say, not yet. Because <laughs> that all takes place like 300 years in the future. And I'm like, oh. Touche. Touche. <laughs> all right. So that's Friday, October 26th. Then Saturday, October 27th, I will be doing SharePoint Saturday, Cincinnati. Woohoo! Yay! We're doing a session on SharePoint Power Apps and Flow. Oh my. Um, and so the idea of my session is I'm going to just talk about the plumbing. So I'm not going to get into building apps as much as here's how you connect Power Apps to Flow. Here's how you connect Flow to SharePoint. Here's how you get data back and forth through the pipes. So that's my goal for that particular session. That, uh, that will be good. Ah, uh, still me? In no. The, oh, yes, you. God. Oh. Shut it. In November, uh, also remember, we are going to have the Power Apps and Flow training. So that is four or five days of remote Power Apps and Flow training with yours truly. So it'll be an awesome little share or Power Apps and Flow class. Uh, so come join us. If you sign up and you mention the podcast, we'll get you a discount. I do not know what that discount is because I do not have that in the notes. But sign up. Take some training with me now todd you may talk already i will be going over to ljubljana slovenia december 4th and 5th for the thrive conference if you are one of our viewers that is in europe that is a great one to go to it's a small boutique sort of conference you get a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, time with the instructors and the other attendees and all that i will be doing there and then i will also be doing a day-long conference on the third about administration and my buddy robbie is going to be joining me for that so that will be a good time. I've known Robbie for a long time. We're, uh, we, we have similar views on things. So you can go to thriveconf.com and sign up for that. For those of you that are like myself and don't speak any language but English, the sessions are all in English. So don't worry about that. 
If you've never been to Slovenia, most Americans don't think about Slovenia, but man, it is awesome. I've been there three or four times. It's beautiful. And with these small conferences, the conference, uh, the people who put it on in this case, uh, a, a wonderful woman named Branka, they go above and beyond to make sure that you have a great time. And especially if you're not from Slovenia, because they really want you to have a great time in their country and love their conference and love their country. It is just an amazing time. So go to thriveconf.com, sign up for that, and I would love to see you in Ljubljana. Yeah, Slovenia is – Slovenia, so that country is um, – it's interesting, right? Because it's really not one I'm very familiar with because they don't do a bunch of yep. stupid world stage stuff. But yep. uh, GDP, they're in the – I think last time I looked at the top 10, right? They are a big deal on the world stage who just they doesn't have a, uh, a boisterous person who argues with our president all the time to cause chaos. Yeah, and they so they without getting into too much of a history lesson, they were part of you know the the communist countries and uh, part of Yugoslavia and had a really really tough time of it when all of that collapsed in the late eighties early nineties. And Slovenia, they they did that thing where they uh, had some really terrible things happen and they just they said we're we're going to build it up, we're going to make it great, and they stuck their nose to the grindstone and yeah, great economy, high tech economy, very well educated people, high earners. It is yeah, it's it's really not on our radar. But, man, you get over there, and it is just an amazing place. So, great place to go. Very cool. Then, speaking of the last little promotion here, not maybe so uh, amazing, is uh, Todd is asleep again. <laughs> I will be at the North American Collaboration Summit, uh, March 14th and 15th. I want you guys to be really excited about that. That is not in Lubania, Lubania whatever. It's not in Great – shut up. It is not in Ljubljana. Great Britain. It is not in, you know, UK or any of that. It is in Branson, Missouri. Oh, yeah. So. We've talked about it before. Branson is great. I have not. Uh, I did not submit anything for that one because it's the same right around the same time as the MVP summit. And I just didn't know what my feelings on that were about all that travel. But the more I think about it, the more I feel like I will be remiss if I miss out on it because I've been there before and it is a great conference. It seems goofy. It's in Bron Branson. Where is Branson even at? I promise if you go. You will not regret it. Mark Rackley puts on a great show. It is, uh, you will love it. So yeah, it's March 15th, uh, 14th to 15th, 2019. I might beg Mark and see if he lets me show up and do some stuff. Well, the good news is, so I had the all day workshop on Power Apps and Flow. And then just this morning I added, a, a, I got approval for another session on Power Apps and Azure SQL. So, um, you know, I'll be there. They're still approving my sessions. Surely a celebrity like you can get on <laughs> the invite. I think Mark Rackley is somehow, and I can't explain it, somehow immune to my charm. I don't know how that works. I, but, I, but I will say I, I keep. I will start the email right now to him so that he can get, get to denying me right away and save us all a lot of time. Have your mom call him. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No kidding. All right. It's eleven fifty four. We should wrap this thing up. Yep. Thanks everybody in the chat room. I'll be around for a little bit. Shane's got to run. Lori's got to run. Uh, but I will be around. Uh, thanks, everybody. We will see you next week. And then we'll see about two weeks when you're at that uh, that conference. We'll see what we can do about getting maybe some maybe do some interviews or something. We'll figure something out. All right. Well, everybody, see you later. See you next week. <laughs>